Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second webinar on pitching and fundraising. Um, I'm happy to have everyone here, as I'm sure Hannah is. And in the other screen there, you can see our guest speakers, Wen Yu and Veronica, who we'll introduce shortly. Um, so before we start, thank you again for joining us. I hope everyone had an easy time logging in and uh, remembering the time change difference because I know there were some issues there that North America hasn't switched uh, back to fall back like Europe has. So uh, today we're going over pitching and fundraising, so selling and supporting your ideas. Um, now just a brief outline before we start. So we're going to give an out, uh, introduction to pitching, so why it's important, sort of the context of pitching it within this youth and landscape. After that, uh, Hannah's going to lead you through the five steps to pitching. Then we're going to chat more about the neuroscience behind this and who you're pitching to. We'll open up to a brief question and answer period on pitching. And then we're going to go transition over to when you and Veronica on fundraising. We'll introduce them to you and we'll let them take it away and you'll have some question period time for them afterwards. So uh, I'm going to switch it over to Hannah now who's going to give you um, <clears throat> the, the introduction to pitching. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so again, just wanted to reiterate what Gabby was saying about welcoming everybody and helping everybody got on okay. Um, and we're going to, what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about the art of the pitch. And um, some of you may be wondering what we mean when we say pitch. Um, it's definitely a slang word. So we kind of, you know, want to look at, number one, we have our Padlet, which we love so much. Our first one there that you can go to and add your definition of a pitch. Because we have a dictionary definition, we have our team definition, but we'd also like to hear from you and your experience. Um, so the dictionary definition, uh, we're going to choose the verb definition of pitch, and that's an active movement to throw the ball and try to get somebody to hit it. Um, and then if you go down through the definitions, eventually you get to this making a bid or trying to get a contract or some other business. And so we, we want to combine those because what you're doing is you're throwing an idea and you're trying to get somebody to make contact with that idea. And um, that's why our definition starts with an idea. We understand that pitching is uncomfortable and uh, it is a learned skill. And that's really important in our definition because, you know, it's it's hard for, even if you have a natural talent for speaking and communicating, still learning how to pitch and communicate your idea in high pressure situations is something you need to work on and develop. Um, some people who study this and some people who are professionals and experts in the field um, of high stakes negotiating feel that Pitching is probably one of the most important things we do because it's how you convince somebody to do something. Um, some ways that you can also look at pitching um, are the elevator speech, which again, you know, is some slang, but basically, say you go into a lift with somebody and you have about two minutes to explain to them your idea. How are you going to communicate that idea in two minutes and at the end of that two minutes are you going to be able to get them to interact with you on it and engage with you on it? Um, before we... Oh, and the other thing that I have on there is um, that the crowdfunding platform idea is the idea where, you know, you can make a video, and the video is your pitch. You're trying to communicate 
why you're raising money for something in a short amount of time and do it in a way that, that gets your audience to feel like they want to donate, that they want to give money, that they want to support your idea. So we'll go through, as we go through this presentation, and kind of talk about some more um, examples and scenarios for pitching. But those were just two I wanted to share. Um, and so I'm on the Padlet. I don't know if you all can see that. But um, let's see. I'm going to see if I can, if everyone can go to the Padlet. We have a few answers. Um, we have someone also agreeing with the literal, the literal throwing the idea at somebody. Um, so, like, trying to give your idea to somebody else. Um, to persuade others to take action and support your idea from Paraya. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. And then, I like that she included that having them supporting you equals hitting the goal. So the pitch is not just about actual throwing it. It's about the contact and it's about them hitting and, and accepting what you're saying and that's what pitching is because that includes success in the definition. I really like that. Um, another thing that we have is from pra, Prakriti. Um, convincing somebody in a short amount of time and trying to get them to contribute as well. Um, other things we have is promoting ideals or products in an impressive way, communication of ideas. Um, Armand says reaching out to the right person in the right way to ensure the greatest influence on the person. And um, I think he's touching or she's touching on an idea that is really important that we'll talk about later, which is your audience and knowing who you're pitching to. So these are great answers, and uh, feel free to add to this as we go on throughout the presentation. Um, but we're going to move on. Um, okay, so. There's a gap. Um, there's a gap between what we innovate, what we think in our brains, and the ideas that we come up with, and how we communicate that. And um, this quote is from Oren Claff, who's the author of Pitch Anything, which is a book for um, high negotiation, high 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 stakes business negotiation. Um, Oren Clough has successfully negotiated um, multi-million dollar mergers and has basically turned his methods into this book, um, which we're getting a lot of our ideas from today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read the quote. There is a fundamental disconnect between the way we pitch anything and the way it is received by our audience. As a result, at the crucial moment when it is most important to be convincing, nine out of ten times we are not. Our most important messages have a surprisingly low chance of getting through. You need to understand why this disconnect occurs in order to overcome it, succeed, and profit. So again, that's just kind of showing that there's a gap. Even if we're absolutely brilliant, which obviously all of us are, it's hard to communicate these ideas. Um, so what Claff does um, in his Pitch Anything methods is he proposes the strong method for pitching. And um, you can Google this if you want to really go into depth um, on how to do this. But, uh, you know, just very quickly, you got to set the frame. And the frame is how you want people think to think about the solution. And if you look at that definition, it says that frames don't combine or mix. They collide. The strongest frame always wins. And so as a pitcher, it's important to set a frame that's strong and that's factual and, and that gets people excited and engaged. Because if you're able to frame it in a way that gets people 
wanting more, they're going to be yours for the rest of the pitch. You want to tell a story. Um, and you want that to be intriguing. And we'll talk a little bit more about the intrigue and why it's important to have that in a pitch and moving on, revealing the intrigue. So basically, <clears throat> you want to pitch to people's basic brain. You want to like provoke some sort of need for action. And like it says on this, you want to use the forces of tension, risk, danger, and uncertainty, and time constraint to really make this exciting, make your pitch exciting. And for us, a lot of us work in um, landscapes, work with challenges, uh, affected by climate change and other really very risky, dangerous situations. And so I think for us, uh, as young professionals in this field, we have an advantage because we understand a lot of the actual risks that are, are happening in our the landscapes that we live and work in. Um, you want to offer the prize. And so that's when you actually say, this is the solution, or this is what we're going to do about the risk, or I am the prize, choose me. Um, once you offer it, then you can go ahead and nail them on the hook point. So that's that final set of emotions, and that's that final engagement. That's when your audience decides that they're going to actually do something about it. That's that call to action. <clears throat> and then in the end, like, um, like, uh, Let's see, who said that? Like, oh, sorry. Like, in the end, the end of the pitch is actually getting somebody to support you. And that's really important because if we include the actual getting the deal and getting the commitment in the pitching, I think that it sets us up for success. Um, and again, there's lots of different methods for pitching. This is just one. Um, so we want to hear from you again. What do you think makes a good pitch? And uh, this is, we want to hear from your experience again because probably many of you have either had experiences trying to sell an idea, trying to convince somebody of something, or have been tried to be convinced of something. And so <clears throat> the second Padlet uh, is available and you can just go ahead and uh, add what you think about pitching uh, and see if, if possibly this Warren, Warren Clough's method is something that you agree with or something that you think is a bunch of rubbish. But yeah, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, I used a cricket pitcher because in the United States we have baseball and we don't have cricket, but I think everybody else in the world has cricket and I really wish I understood it. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Gabby and yeah, just want to say thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, so thanks, Hannah, for that part. So I, like I said in the introduction, I'm going to go over now more of the neuroscience background to this. So Hannah touched a bit on this point of revealing the intrigue. And we're going to talk about just how this works with the human brain, because it's not as simple as it may seem. So before we start, I'm going to give you a bit of background on our brains. So I preface this by saying I have no way. Hey, Gabby. Yes? Um, I'm still presenting. Sorry to interrupt you. I don't know if you wanted to switch. There we go. OK, thank you. Great. Um, OK, so I am going to go over the brain, like I said, just shortly. And so I preface this by saying I'm no way a neuroscience. But this is more about the background, and the psychology, and the way we think related to pitching. So we have three different brains, and I'm sure most of you know that uh, we actually don't have three brains. We have one brain. But when I say we have three brains, we have three different parts of our brain. And this is because our brain developed at three 
different points in time in our evolution as humans. So we have the crocodile brain, or also known as reptilian, a basic sort of evolutionary brain. The midbrain, or limbic, sort of a bit more higher processing. It deals a lot with feelings and the meaning of social situations. It's where our trust and loyalty is. And then our neurocortex, uh, which is the highest point of our thinking system. And this is where our problem solving is, our rational thought, and our language. Now, why is that? Uh, the, now, these, these different brains, as much as they work separately, they also work together. And so, for a brief example, uh, imagine you are driving your car, right? Or you're driving your bike, or you're on the bus, and you hear someone yelling across the street. Well, automatically, what happens is your crocodile brain, so this very evolutionary basis that has these instinctive feelings, so fight or flight, it will say, okay, there's a panic situation. Someone is yelling, there's aggression maybe, what's happening? It'll then flow because your crocodile brain has recognized this as an important situation to pass on to the midbrain, to your midbrain. And your midbrain is going to analyze the situ social situation. You'll maybe look around, you'll see that the person that's yelling is actually a young man waving to his friend across the street or waiting to cross the light. Finally, this is going to go to your neural context cortex and you'll solve the problem by saying that you're not in danger, everything's okay, it's a normal so so social situation. So I'm going to look now at uh, what you guys say, say, say makes a good pitch. So um, Daphne says a good pitch is understanding what someone uh, you're pitching to does or involved in and how what you do is related with pointers on what they can be involved in. Um, and I think that's very interesting because it's sort of appealing to uh, those people's ideas and those people's maybe interests and values and speaking to those. And that is sort of what we'll be doing. Um, and I'll get into that in a second. Armand says, a good pitch is communicating the idea in the right level based on the audience and familiarity with the topic. Sort of what Daphne said, but I think something important that uh, I want you guys to keep in mind over the next couple slides is about this thing of familiarity with the topic. Because as much as this is great that we're all experts, we're all passionate, this would also be a, a drawback with pitching. And I want you guys to keep this in mind. Um, and then we have Guillermo that says that he believes the most important part is practice and a convincing frame. OK. Um, it seems like there's a lot of good ideas there, but I'm going to move on. So I don't know if anyone is familiar with Charlie Brown, but he is the example I'm going to use for this. So. Essentially, I, I presented these brains to you, and why are they important? Okay, it's great to know that we have different processing systems, and it's a cool tidbit of fact to share, I don't know, with your family around the dinner table. But why is it important, and why is it relevant to pitching? So the croc brain, so if you remember, this basic evolutionary brain is a filtering system for the rest of our levels. Sort of like in that car example, where it was the, the part of the brain that sort of analyzes your twin first and decides instinctively, is it time to react or am I safe? Now, sort of drawing on um, what Armand said about communicating something you're familiar with, um, when we communicate something we're familiar with or when we communicate something we're passionate about, have a lot of background in, we communicate from the neurocortex, so this problem solving and complex thought system. The problem is, when people are receiving your pitches, they're receiving it to the crocodile brain. And when Hannah talked about intrigue, this is where this difference between the neurocortex and the crocodile brain becomes really important. Because something that is intriguing or sort of been able to uh, conceptualize by the neurocortex can't necessarily be conceptualized in the same way as the crocodile brain. And so I'm going to give you an example. So if you're familiar with Charlie Brown, and uh, I know I grew up with him because my mom grew up with him, and so I sort of share that. But when he's in class, all the time, all he can hear from the teachers are these like sounds, and you never know what the teacher is saying. And he used to kill me when I was a kid because I really wanted to know. So it's this wah, 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 wah sound. And similarly to the cartoon on the other side of the slide, Basically, this, this guy is telling his dog what the dog should or shouldn't do, but the dog only picks up on the basic things it recognizes. Ginger, 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 so its name. So essentially, this is what your crocodile brain is doing. Because it's evolutionary um, in nature, it looks for these danger, intrigue, or excitement. This basic fight or flight emotions. And uh, 
anything that's not labeled with these type of emotions, something important that needs to analyze right now, sort of goes into spam folder. Or it's, a, it's truncated and so shortened in a way that you lose a lot of valuable information. So basically, we need to make a pitch extraordinary in a way for it to get past this crocodile brain, but extraordinary and not too complex. So how do we bridge this gap? How do we make sure that the 90% of the information you're pitching doesn't get disregarded because it isn't interesting or doesn't get ignored and it doesn't get sort of shortened in a way that the person you're pitching to no longer understands you? So essentially, to summarize, the croc brain doesn't want it complicated, doesn't want it boring. If it's boring, your crocodile brain will ignore it and the pitch won't get through. If it's dangerous, it'll engage this flight system of the crocodile brain, and it'll have this huge aversion to it. If it's too complicated, a lot of the information is going to be lost when the croc brain sends it up to the next level of processing, and your pitch won't make much sense and won't seem very novel or interesting. So if we have two goals in a pitch, and those pitch are getting through to your audience or the person you're asking something of, and getting your message well-received and accepted, there's going to be four things you want your pitch to do after following these five steps Hannah gave you. So first, you want to focus on the big picture. The croc brain isn't interested in tiny, tiny, minute details. This is just overcomplicated for it. After this, you want to be emotional. This is where Hannah sort of mentioned the intrigue and sort of hitting these key emotions and speaking to the evolutionary sort of, a, you know, fight, flight, excitement, danger, novelty, new type of things. And to do that, you can use visual cues if you have a presentation you're giving, so lots of great, exciting photos, or really descriptive language. And that relates to the frame as well there. Third, you want to focus on the here and now, as much as you're focusing on the big picture. You have to remember the croc brain is a quick processing center, and it has a short attention span. And finally, you can't keep these thought processes to abstract, and this can be difficult, especially like Hannah said, a lot of us work in landscapes, and uh, a lot of us deal with climate change, and that can relate to a lot of abstract social issues, economic issues, environmental issues. You want to give the croc brain concrete evidence to understand that it can process. So if you're focusing on these elements and following those five steps Hannah gave you, Hopefully, you can start practicing how to deliver a successful pitch. And like Hannah said at the start, it's important to know that this is a learned skill. So we presented you guys sort of with the basis, but it's always about practice, whether that's practicing on family members, just a pitch you have that's more important, or practicing convincing your younger sibling to try a new type of food. Just practice this type of system in every day and get used to it, because the more you practice, uh, the better it will get. I think. Uh, the man that um, wrote the book, The Art of Pitching, he said at the start, you require 10,000 hours of learning to become the perfect pitcher. And so just think about that and don't look at it as too overwhelming, but right now is a great chance to start and think of it in a positive light that you're going to head start ahead of everyone else. So with that, we're going to open up some question and answers on pitching. So feel free to type in to the chat box if you have anything. Um, uh, to ask Hannah or I about this. After that, uh, we will <coughs> move on to our guest speakers on fundraising. So we'll give you guys a couple minutes to do that, and in about five minutes, uh, we'll close the question and answer period. Um, I see in the chat box, just on the side there, that some people are having audio issues. So if you're having audio issues, sometimes you can't hear because your headphones aren't in. It's a weird glitch with webinar, and I know I've experienced this, so try plugging those in uh, or plugging them out. And Guillermo, to answer your question, yes, it's being recorded. It'll be uploaded to the YPARD, so that's uh, their YouTube account in a couple days. Um, we'll edit over if there's any gaps in sort of the recording, if there's pauses, and if there's any static, we'll clean that up and post it. Um, OK, so why you guys are thinking of questions or maybe just waiting for the next uh, part to start, I'm going to post two Padlets on the, the right-hand side there in the chat box. And these are just sort of provide uh, question spaces that Veronica and Wen Yu can look at or that Hannah and I can facilitate a discussion on after they're done presenting. Uh, Gabby, 
Uh, someone asked if there is more information on the psychology of communication, if there's any readings on that topic. Um, so I'm happy to provide that. I've done some research in communicating, uh, specifically around climate change. So, um, and it, it relates a bit to what Armand had said in our discussion box that I uh, touched on just briefly. And related to, for example, communicating environmental things, something we have to be aware of is where the person you are is coming from culturally. And when I mean culturally, I don't mean that someone is from the US and someone's from Canada or someone's from the UK or Namibia. What I mean is that we all have these different uh, ideologies in a cultural sense. So you could be individualistic, you could be communitarian, hierarchical, egalitarian, and people with different ideologies will process things in different ways. So it's important to know your audience, which was also another comment. And uh, in terms of communicating, that's something that you can think about with keywords. Um, okay, I'm going to post those Padlets for you guys, and then we'll move on to our guest speakers. Hey guys, I hope you can hear me. Uh, Gabby, Hannah, if you can hear me, can you just like do a thumbs up stuff? Yep. Um, yeah, good, all right, awesome. So um, I'm going to introduce myself and I'll get it, and then we'll jump right in into discussion about fundraising. Um, so my name is Wang Yu Wang. You might have got a few emails from me, um, or for some of you, you might have got a lot of emails from me. Um, so I'm the person in charge of fundraising and partnership for the Global Landscapes Forum U session. So that means if you have any questions about how you're going to fundraise uh, in the future or getting letters and so on and so forth, uh, you can email me. Um, some of you have already done that. I've sent out around like 70 <laughs> different types of email templates already. So if you have emailed me and I haven't responded, just uh, you know send me a gentle reminder. It's good, uh, and I'll get onto it. So. Don't worry about hassling me a bit more and trying to get me to respond to you. Uh, that said, this is Veronica Martin. Um, she's our guest speaker for today, so she has taken time out from her very busy schedule uh, to come and talk to us. Uh, Veronica is a fundraising and charity professional. She has many years of experience in What else? <laughs> she has a, I'm she still has, a youth. <laughs> she's a young person. <laughs> she has many years of experience um, fundraising for different charities, different causes, and she is also personally the, one of the chief executive, chief executive of um, Powerless Foundation, which is a youth-based, um, youth-oriented leadership program here in London. Um, so she has also a great passion personally about uh, young people and you know, like young youth leadership. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Veronica um, to talk about fundraising, and she'll give you some tips. After that, I'll give you some tips on crowdfunding. Excellent. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, <laughs> venue. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me here. Yes, I have got a full-on schedule, but I'm never too busy for young people. They're the most important um, you know, generation of our time because you are all informing uh, what's going to happen in the world um, for the future. So I'm very happy to give up my time to you. Now, in terms of fundraising, I'll cut to the chase. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been fundraising for the past 15 years within the not-for-profit sector and not just for organizations but for individuals as well. Uh, prior to that I've been in sales so I, I sort of know about asking um, when you actually really don't want to ask. <laughs> so so I've, I've sort of gone through that whole thing so I know exactly where you're at. Um, now my, my major major advice to all of you is that uh, the main reason why people don't give or won't support you is because you don't ask. Um, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, um, whether you're going into the low shop, um, going to the gym, whatever, um, walking down the road, if you don't ask, you're not going to get. And that's how I was brought up. <laughs> you know, um, I, I always ask for, for what, what um, I need at that time. So in fundraising, that's where it really comes out. Uh, for raising funds to, because uh, I know all of you, when you were saying that um, you need to raise money uh, to for some aspect uh, of the conference, obviously I'm sure you will understand that your immediate community is your first point of contact. Um, they're the most effective means of raising the funds quickly. I call it the low-hanging fruit. Um, these are the people that know you. 
Um, they support what you're doing. They're very proud of you for getting this far. Um, and so it's really um, in your court to, to reach out to them um, and, and to ask them for support, no matter how small. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all the different um, you know, nationalities that's on this webinar right now and the sort of type of money, but even if it's one pound or a dollar, everything adds up. Um, you've got to, the, the, the key thing as well is you've got to figure out how you're going to accept gifts because if you're asking money from an individual, they want to know that you've got your bank account set up or that you've got a website set up like PayPal that would accept donations because remember, if you're going to be doing it online, you need to have these things in place in the first place. Obviously, if you've got a collection bucket, that would help tremendously. Um, and social media, as you know, plays a big part in all of fundraising. In my experience of the past 10 years, it is the key way that individuals raise money, whether they're trying to raise money for a charity, or they're running a, a, a marathon, or they have a sick child. Um, the internet is your, your best, as you know already, it's your best bet. Um, and as I said, you need to start with your own networks, your relatives, your co-workers, your neighbours, other acquaintances. Um, they're, 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 you, because you've formed a relationship with them, they're more likely to give. And the other aspect of that is you need to start a chain reaction. So that person that's given you, you know, whether it's, say it's your uncle who's given you, you know, a dollar. That uncle who's given you a dollar, you then say to that uncle, can you spread the word amongst people that you know, you know, whether it's, you know, in the local shop or the bar, I don't know. Um, but, but whatever, just, just to spread the word. And if you can, can sort of find um, some sort of support, have some sort of badge or something that says, I don't know if you've got that when you, you know, this sort of badge that everyone's no, got. We can do it. Yeah, you should do yeah. some sort of sticker or something that, that you carry with you everywhere you go. It's not easy for everyone to have a business card. I, I do encourage my young people to have a business card. Um, but if you haven't got it, just something that signifies what you're doing. You've achieved a lot, you know, and congratulations for getting this far. Um, and in order to make it a, a real success for you um, from the outset is, is to be able to not worry about the finance and just to be able to raise that before you get there. Um, obviously, you've all heard about crowdfunding, which when you is going to talk about later. Um, but that, that really is picking up a lot of, lot of steam. And, you know, on top of what Yen Yu's going to say, when Yu's going to say, all I say to you is that check out the different types of crowdfunding websites. There's lots out there, lots of them offering you a better way of doing it. But make sure you use the right one for what you want to raise instead of just going for the first one that comes up on Google. Um, I, want to take, I want to tell you about an example of two young people uh, that I work, worked, worked with. Um, one's named Rachel, one's named Shani. Um, Rachel wanted to study, um, to do a master's, I believe it was in political science or something at Oxford, but she didn't have the money um, to do that. So she set up a, a, a crowdfunding website on um, Hub, it's called Hub Bub. <laughs> so I haven't got a slide to show you the, the um, link, but perhaps you can text everybody when you and give them the link to both Rachel's um, crowdfunding site and also oh god <laughs> and, and Shani's Shani's website because what you ought to do is look at how everybody else has done it. Do not create your crowdfunding website without researching how everyone has done it because it's better to go with what's tried and tested. Um, because you've only got how many days have they got to raise the money? Is it three weeks. Three weeks. You've got three weeks. So go for the tried and tested even if you have to just cut cut and paste. Go for the tried and tested. Um, now, there are other ways of raising funds, and that's my, my expertise is in funds from charitable trusts and foundations. Now, in your case, and I must admit, uh, there, there, it's going to take time to raise that money um, from foundations because they, number one, they like to have a set application process. They have a set application process, and you need to send it to them in good time. Um, but in any case, Trusts, foundations and trusts are set up just to give out money. A lot of people don't know that. They've been set up just to give money to good causes. And I know um, for a fact that a lot of grant making trusts give, give money to environmental issues um, and also to young people. We love young people. So um, people do give money out to that. So what you ought to do is what I tend to do 
when I'm when I'm looking for fonts personally um, is to go onto Google again. Google's getting a bid promotion here. Um, go onto Google again and just type in a couple of keywords. I normally type in um, grant making trust, and then you type in something like conferences or young people or environments or something that keyword that links with what you're trying to do and then some will come up and then from there you can then go on if they've got a website you go into their website and look at what their criteria is it's really important to be very clear about what you're asking for and how you are asking for it as the speaker before said um, now because because I'm, I'm sort of like doing this on a sort of immediate urgent basis in terms of raising funds I must admit to you that I would tend to hone in on celebrities, uh, whether they're in your country or abroad. A lot of celebrities support environmental causes, um, and in fact, even this morning I typed in, um, you know, something to do with environment, young people, and there's so many celebrities come up. Now, maybe you won't. Obviously, you might not have their email addresses or personal phone number. Uh, but they're, most of them are on Twitter. So if you can get the hashtag thinking landscape or think landscape going and then tag in a celebrity as you do so, then that would help because what you want to do is work collectively. Whether you are in the UK or in Mexico, you really ought to work collectively to try and get you know, youth in landscapes noticed. When you're noticed, people are more likely to think, oh, this is really credible. We will support it and therefore they will look to supporting you. Um, so really look at celebrities, who's supporting the sort of cause and issues that, that you're, you're dealing with, and tweet them. You know, it does work. I did, I did that a few times with a number of organizations, and amazingly, one of, them, one of the celebrities became our patron. So you never, as I said from the beginning, if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> so you really ought to try different things. Um, apart from celebrities, I would say, to try and get somebody to champion what you're doing um, on a voluntary basis. I know that you're doing all you can on your own, and I, I really sympathise with you. I understand. Um, so what you ought to do, even if it's just a, you know, even if it's a colleague or a, a family member or a fellow student, try and get somebody next to you who's supporting you, supporting you with what you're trying to do and raise the funds for what you're doing. Um, that will take a lot of pressure off you because it's not easy. Um, but it will take a lot of pressure off you, and they will help to tweet, promote, you know, get the message across. Obviously, the the big the big message is the fact that you are a leader in in, in global you know in global issues. You've been selected out of hundreds and thousands of young people, um, so get somebody working alongside you to help with promoting that. Um, the other area I've thought about, and maybe it's just relevant for some of you, but I always tap into universities uh, with young, because obviously there's young people there that are studying a degree in your area of interest. And notice that we call them millennials, they're really generous. You know, they, they obviously, they're all, everyone's struggling, but they will even just find, you know, a few, few pounds or dollars um, to help somebody else who's trying to sort of further the area that they're also interested in. So really look at the schools and colleges and universities in your area or even just in the region or in the country and tap into them as well and don't forget about the alumni if you go onto any um, say you go into the Harvard University's website um, you will find a list of members or people that are alumni or um, you'll find lecturers and they've got their Twitter account <laughs> so just you know just tap into that really hold me in on these people who are sharing exactly um, what you're all about. You're the future and this is going to make a difference and it will also spread the word a lot. Um, companies are brilliant as well, obviously the company down the road. And it doesn't have to be a big company. It could be the local shop. Um, I, I, I've actually noticed that local shops are actually a lot more generous than some of the big companies. Um, so, and maybe organize, you know, a youth in landscape day. It's never too late. Um, and when you, if you could get some badges for them to print mm. off, <laughs> that would help. Or little posters that you can put up around the place, or you know, print out. Um, as I said, leave no stone unturned. 
Um, there's always different ideas. I think of different things every day, and I think, oh my god, let me try that, um, and it it works. <laughs> so um, you know that that's the advice I'd like to give to you. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm I'm, I'm an open book. It's not <laughs> it's not often that you get a fundraiser sharing their deepest <laughs> secrets. So um, if you if you have got any questions at all right now, I'm I'm ready to answer them. Yeah. Um, we can take any quick questions now, or I can go over crowdfunding. Um, so if you got a quick question, please type them in. If not, I'll go over crowdfunding, and you can ask both of us questions at the same time. Yeah. Um, so any quick questions? When well, you... Yes, hi. Yeah. How about you go ahead? How about you go ahead? Okay, yeah, yeah, good. So, so just, like, you know, marinate in all the advice that <laughs> Veronica has given you, and yeah. And type questions down as I'm talking, right? Um, so I just want to quickly summarize what Veronica has said, in like kind of in my own way, and to get it across to you guys. So I think if I were to summarize, kind of the general thing she said is, be proactive, um, be really proactive, be clear, right, and be creative. So a lot of you guys have been emailing me and saying, look, it's impossible for me to raise this amount in this amount of time, and I completely sympathize with the difficulty. Um, but I am someone who has done that at the same time this time last year um, with generally the same amount that you have done. So, you know, it is difficult, but please be proactive. Um, be very clear and be very creative. So, like Veronica has told you, there's so many ways to go about doing this. You can talk to your local companies, talk to your, tap into your network, um, talk to your relatives. These are people who are likely to help you. And even if it's by a very small amount, um, it eventually adds up and, you know, it will make it worthwhile. So do not be afraid to ask for small amounts. Um, the other thing that, just to, some, before I go on to crowdfunding, is like Gabby said, remember the psychology of people's giving, right? So when I usually give to a friend, after I give my friend some money to fundraise for a cause, I actually become more interested in that cause. So people become more invested after giving as well. So that's when they're more likely to help you spread the word. So if your uncle gives you a small amount and you go, you already invested in me, can you go and talk to your friends? He's more likely to say yes. So it's all step by step because once you invest in something, you feel like that is part of your identity and you're more likely to go on and help that person even further. So, so be proactive. Um, so I'm going to talk about crowdfunding. I can talk a little fast. So if you don't understand something, do... Um, you know, ask questions afterwards. So crowdfunding, what is it? So uh, Veronica gave you a lot of good advice on fundraising in general, so I'm only going to talk about the subset, uh, which is crowdfunding. And that is basically when you set up an online web page and you share that link um, to your friends or, to, or on social media so that even people who don't know you are able to see it. And they donate through a link um, on that web page. That's crowdfunding. Um, so I'm going to summarize this into three things. Number one, why. Why do you want to do crowdfunding? Crowdfunding gives you kind of the way I think about it is it gives you the best of both worlds um, because your friends who are interested in helping you out can now just do it online. And for a lot of people, that is a lot easier than carrying cash around and meeting you up and giving to you. And a single um, page where you can summarize your pitch and say, this is why you should fund me. You can, a lot of crowdfunding websites now allow you to put on videos, put on images to make it look interesting, engaging. Um, so it's a good place for you to say, hey, would you check out the link and donate to me? And that's, that's very easy and doesn't require any money to set up. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, but like I said, it's the best of both worlds. So what crowdfunding also does is it allows you to send that link to people you don't know and allow it to be spread. And you'll be surprised because when I set up crowdfunding last year, around 50% of people who eventually donated are people I don't know. And that is because a lot of people currently um, on the internet are, are good people who are willing to help someone out if they identify with them. So think of your audience as someone um, of the same tribe, right? You have the same values, you want the same thing. So write your crowdfunding profile um, to fit someone who will be interested. It's always going to be hard for you to convince someone who has absolutely no interest in the environment. But if someone comes across that website because they see their friends donated to it and shared it on their Facebook page and they say, this guy's doing something really cool, they might actually donate money to you. 
So the good thing about crowdfunding is it also allows people who don't know you, um, don't have much connection to you, at least directly, to give something to you because they see something in common with you. Um, so think of them as your tribe. Um, the second question is, how do I do that? So a lot of people go, how do I set up crowdfunding? It's actually really easy. There are many websites uh, on the internet. Um, and for example, Just Giving. Um, there's another new one called Start Some Good. Um, there's also another one called GoFundMe. I will be sending all of these to you. So if you didn't catch that, don't worry. Um, there are many more out there. Um, so Start Some Good, um, Just Giving, um, and GoFundMe. And they can all be uh, individual <coughs> crowdfunding as well. So you go on there, you log in, create a profile, and you start dropping things on there, um, you know, text, video, um, pictures. And then you share it. So that's basically how you do it. Um, and you share it. You can start sending it to people you know with little messages. You can say, hey, would you send this on to people that's interested? Leave your contact there so if someone wants to you know, donate to you but isn't really sure, then they can get in touch with you. Um, the main thing I can say is be personal. And what I mean personal is make it vulnerable. Um, last year I said, look, I'm a person from this background and there's no way I can get to this like, conference if nobody helps me. I was very, very clear with the intentions and I said, um, you know, I'll, I will take pictures for you, I'll write things back, I'll call you, I'll recognize you, whatever it is. So I was very straightforward with what I can give back. Um, so uh, make it very personal so that when people look at your profile and they read it, they, they understand how you feel, how much you want to get to this place. Um, the other thing is, and I think this is the last thing I'll, uh, I'll uh, two more things I'll say on crowdfunding is do not be scared to ask for a small amount. Mm -hmm. And this is the power of the internet. Let's say you have 400 friends on Facebook, where according to the Facebook is the average number of friends per person. So let's say you have 400 friends on Facebook. Even if every single one of them only give you one pound, that adds up to 400. That's an immense amount. That could be less effort if you do it really well than asking for a big corporation to give you 400 pounds because they might not care. So whereas one pound might be something everyone can realistically do. So um, do not be afraid of saying, don't feel bad for giving me just one pound because when other people see other people giving one pound, they feel like, okay, I can just give one pound, this less pressure, and then eventually that number adds up. So don't be afraid of asking for very small amounts. And the uh, last thing is get started. Um, so you only have three weeks to do this, not a lot of time. Um, but it can be done. Uh, so get started, and once you start to see some people donating, you'll feel more motivated, and that'll motivate you to work even harder. Um, when Veronica was talking to me about this earlier, so it's very important to get started no matter how stuck you feel. Um, so that summarizes kind of what I said. Um, so in general, don't worry, it's not too late. Tap into your network. You never know who's able to help you. And yeah, so get started. So that's, that's kind of... Uh, Veronica and me, um, fundraising yes. <laughs> and crowdfunding. Of course, we have limited time, so we can't, you know, Veronica can't dispense all her wisdom or 15 years of work to you. So <laughs> she can try, try, but you will be here for a long time. So obviously, we're not going to be able to cover everything that we want to say. So, yeah, questions? <laughs> There's some on this side. Do you want to take some of Yeah, them? sure. Okay. So, uh, how to approach a particular person to ask for a sponsor because there are a lot of contact email on one website. Right, how to approach okay. a particular person. Okay. Yeah, so you see a website yeah. on this one. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now yeah. that comes down to identifying who would have the budget. Mm. You're talking about, are they talking about a person in the company? Or if yeah, you're talking about a person in the company, normally it's the corporate social responsibility team. Um, is that I'm, I hope Sanjay, that's um, the sort of person you think I'm, I'm in a company. I think you're talking about. But normally it's the corporate social CSR team they're called, or mm -hmm. corporate social responsibility team. Um, sometimes it's the um, HR team. Um, I tend to go for the chief exec. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> I'm always if you go for the chief exec, he'll filter it down. Um, but obviously. The, the more you, I, I would say the more you go after the better within the company, um, mm. but initially I go personally, chief exec, corporate social responsibility team, and then the HR team. Yeah, 
if you can actually see the chief executive email, definitely go for it, yeah, right? Yeah. Like that's a great opportunity. Yeah. Most of them like hide there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, and yeah. then and then the how is um, obviously this has got how mm. um, as well. So so the how is obviously you're not going to send a sort of round you know round robin um, template email. You're going to personalize it. So I normally look at there. I know this sounds really geeky and OCD, but it works. <laughs> I normally look at their annual report. So if you go on to um, a company's, <laughs> if you go onto a company's website, all of them have the bit at the bottom um, where they've done something for their investors. So if you go onto a Microsoft website or anything, at the bottom it will have investors report. And within that, you'll see different reports like, um, you know, particularly about the environment. They do lots of reports on the environment mm -hmm. and how they're helping. Mm -hmm. um, so I look at that and I use keywords from that to frame the introduction of my email and also to frame my subject heading. Because obviously when you send the email, if it just says fund me <laughs> or it just says help, it's not going <laughs> to get noticed. So you've got to make sure it's linked to what they're interested in. So that's how I normally approach it and make sure that email links in with, with their interests. So obviously at the end you're going to be asking for support, uh, but the initial thing is to make sure those first three um, lines are matched to what, what they're definitely interested in from their corporate perspective. Yeah, I think that's very good advice. So. Um, make sure that you start the email with something that catches their interest, right? And Veronica's suggestion is, you know, look into the resources online, like annual report. I never thought of that. <laughs> and I've been doing so much of this. I've never thought of that. And it's just a really way, good way. And they, they will feel, hey, you put effort into yeah. this. You didn't just copy paste the email and send it to everyone that you have on your Gmail contact list. So yeah, that's very good advice. Cater it. I'll, I'll take the next question because it's crowdfunding and they're actually quite related. So how do you do crowdfunding um, if basically you're, like the people you want to fundraise from don't use social media. Um, okay, so okay, so 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 firstly, crowdfunding is not a solution for everything. So if you're going to be sharing it on Twitter and sharing it on Facebook, if people don't use Twitter and Facebook, that's going to be difficult. Um, they should probably have access to um, you know internet, so they can still get access to your web page. Um, this ties in into like something else I want to say, which is don't think of crowdfunding as the sole alternative. It's not a lazy way out. It's not just you putting a website online, a, a web page actually, and just not doing anything about it. E even if you share it on Facebook, even if you share it on Twitter, you're going to have to do it a lot. You're going to have to call up your friends and say, hey, did you see what I shared on Facebook? Did you share what? Did you see what I shared on Twitter? So it all goes back to the same thing that. Even with crowdfunding web pages, you'll still have to do a lot of calling. You'll still have to approach people. So if people don't have social media, you're still have, going to have to go to your friend and say, so I know you don't like you really use or check Facebook, but I started this thing, show them, give them the URL, you know, the link, so then they can then go back, search, donate. Right? So crowdfunding is not an easy or lazy way out. You still have to do a lot of kind of calling. The other thing that I did with crowdfunding, and this was rather random, is I simply emailed people out of nowhere. I don't know any of those people. I tweeted them. And this is why she was saying earlier, a per celebrities, you know, last year I tweeted Ellen Page. Um, <laughs> anyone know who Ellen Page is? She's basically a celebrity in Hollywood. She didn't donate. Uh, it's okay. She's still awesome. But it's pretty funny because she obviously can see it and her followers can see it. You never know. So. Um, there's internet now, so therefore, good reason to tweet anyone with your little link. You can actually even shorten the link so you can have more words to write on your Twitter. So there's a lot you can do with crowdfunding. Even if people do media or they use social media but don't know, make sure you do it, put a lot of effort into it and do it outside the internet as well. That's what I would say. Dude, sorry, can I just add to that? In yeah. the, sorry, I'm going to say in the old days, sorry. <laughs> we, before, before the internet, we had uh, sponsorship forms. So what, and people still use it actually, they, because um, no, not everybody, particularly the older generation, don't have social media. So we used to just print out, I don't know if you could do a template for them and send them, mm -hmm. but just a sponsorship form which you could take around with you mm -hmm. when you're walking, and then you just, you know, people just sign the thing and, you know, put their email, no, they don't have email, no, just put how much they <laughs> want to donate and give you, give you money that way. But at least it's an official, because remember, individuals are looking to trust you looking to trust what you're doing, that it's sort of credible. 
So as long as it's got the logo and you know just the, the just the information about the the, the conference, etc., people are more likely to give. So when you will send you a sort of template for a sponsorship form that you can carry around with you. Yay. Um, Veronica, a question earlier from, I'm just scrolling up to see if we miss any question, from Armin. Armin asks, do you suggest us to mention the amount we expect from each individual or oh, okay. leave it open-ended? Good question, good question. Um, a lot of the time, I don't know if anyone saw, I put a tweet up of the sort of template um, budget. I think what you all is a budget um, which says what, how much, how much would pay for what as part of the whole, you know, trip or the conference you're doing? And because people do like specific amounts most of the time, um, particularly companies as well. Uh, so I do normally specify how much and what it's for, from a dollar up to I don't know, a hundred dollars, whatever. But tell them how much it pays for. In some cases, yeah, it's you give them the option to have an open-ended amount. But because you want to, in my mind as a fundraiser, I always think about a target. If I've got to raise 10 grand, 10,000 by that date, I break the whole month down and work out what do I have to raise that, you know, that week, that week, and how am I going to break that down again? So the specific item, how many people I need and how much I need. So try and break it down as much as you possibly can because it will make it more realistic in your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, if you guys have been getting the letter of support from me, that includes a breakdown of the amount estimated for you. Um, like I said, if you haven't like got that, just hassle me, and like I got a list of to-dos, so I should get around to you, but if you haven't got it, hassle me. Um, otherwise, th there will be a budgetary breakdown, um, and you can use that too. That's what I'm out. Sorry. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question for you uh, earlier. Sorry. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Oh yeah. Okay. So, hmm, what was that? Oh, okay. I think this is for you. Okay. Uh, it's really broad. Um, which media do you think are more effective nowadays? Okay. Is it YouTube or is it social media? Or it's very broad. That's what Alessia. I, I, I personally, yeah. I think. Um, I, I saw some research that said actually. Um, social media, you know, Twitter. Mm. A lot of um, fundraisers, individuals who are raising money for themselves or causes, or even trying to get a petition signed, use Twitter mm. because you get the greatest number of people in this everybody. Mm. And as long as your um, you guys <laughs> sort out your branding and marketing and make sure it's promoted with a hashtag, um, that that is, I understand Twitter is your most effective channel. Obviously, if you've got a lot of professionals on um, LinkedIn, that's good as well. But I don't think people like that on LinkedIn very much. But Twitter, people tend to expect it. Mm. So um, that, that's, um, for me, that's the most effective thing. To do. OK. Uh, a lot of questions now. Um, one for you, and yeah. then I think one for me, so you can think about yes. yours. I'll answer this. But um, Dinesh has a question about what keywords you can use, for example, when you're tweeting. Celebrities, or um, maybe like we have a video. Uh, uh, you can answer that too. So I think, I think basically, you know, it depends, right? So do your research. If you say tweet every single celebrity, I mean, it's it's always a balance between quality and quantity, right? You can tweet out like a thousand things a day, and nobody would really care because you tweet to every single person. Um, and then you might get lucky that some people go, oh, that's interesting, donate to you. Um, but I think just 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 be very just just do your research, like. When I, I, I thought about tweeting Adam Page for like you know a proper five minutes before I sent the tweet, it's only 140 characters. I think that's quite a lot of research. Um, so it didn't work out. But sometimes it works out. So think about what that person is like. Uh, is this company the company that tried to look hip and young? Because you have companies now that do that on social media, right? Like Shell has these videos, uh, incredibly hilarious personally speaking. Um, and they try to look hip and young while they're talking about natural gas, right? I don't know if you guys have seen those videos. I'm, I'm digressing. My point is you want to look at how they're trying to come across and then tweet like in response to that, right? If they're very serious, then you might need to have a bit more serious tweet. If they're individuals, you can make it more personal. So I think it really depends. Um, okay. Um, yes, de definitely. Um, when, when, you, when you approach people, and be, be really imaginative. Yeah. I know when people say tweet, they always think 140 characters. 
but actually what I found really <laughs> effective on one of my Twitter accounts, one of my many Twitter accounts, is, um, you know, pick, pick quotes. So just take out, you know, go onto your, um, you know, the, the think, think Landscape website and, and have a look at that and get some key things from there and use that as a pick quote. People love pick quotes. And then you put in there the link to your website or what you're doing or way to support what you're doing in order to, you know, make a difference in the world. You're all young leaders. You know, you're, you're in a really good position. I wish I was your age. I'd be fundraising. <laughs> I'd hit my target by now. But, um, but use, be really creative with your tweets. If you're going to use Twitter, use something. There's something called um, Quote, K-W-O-T-E, and it's a way to create quotes. So you think about your environment, your region. What's going on that's affecting the landscape? and pick up on that and use that as a quote, then tag that to your website if you've got a website or tag it to your crowdfunding website. You know, do 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 something creative. People don't like boring. Um, they're going to ignore it. Um, so do, do something like that and always use the, the hashtag mm. think, think, think landscape. landscape. Okay, uh, we have to wrap up. So the very last question, I think, right? Can we answer one question? No, do I ended it. No? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think the last question is how do we identify what specific benefits that would convince a private company? How do I identify specific benefits that would convince a company? Because I think a lot of people go into this and they don't know what companies are looking for. Go to their annual report and it will tell you. Annual report. Go on to corporate annual reports. Go on to any of them, unilaterally any of them. Go on to the annual report. It will tell you, and you will know exactly what to write. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Veronica. Thanks. And you. Um, I'm sure everybody really appreciated that. I loved seeing how active you guys were in the chat bar, and your questions were great. I know there were a lot more questions there that. Uh, when you and Veronica had the time to answer, but I'm sure if uh, if when you have the time, she might be able to answer some of them herself, or Veronica can note them down and they can try to get back to you guys some other way. Um, now, just before we wrap up, uh, Hannah has put up a poll. So we've discussed having a separate sort of webinar uh, where you guys could ask more questions to when you and she could talk more about fundraising if she has the time. So if you guys could answer that and say if you'd be interested in that, we would really appreciate it. Besides that, thank you for coming. Don't forget to sign up for the next webinar on November 11th at the same time. It's on two more professional skills, uh, critical thinking and active listening. And beyond that, thank you guys so much again. And I will pass it over to Hannah for her final words. Thanks, Gabby. Um, and also, thanks to Wen Yu and Veronica for that great information. I also crowdfunded. Um, I've done two crowdfunding campaigns, and I know that they can be stressful, but they work. So, um, also, yeah, just to encourage everybody to really work on your pitch and uh, practice it with the people around you, with animals with trees in the shower, whatever it is, just get that ready to go so that you can use it to, you know, fund your vision, what you want to do. Um, and yeah, that poll is up in the right hand side of your um, picture. You should be able to click on it and tell us if you need more information about fundraising. And uh, yeah, it's been great and look forward to seeing you all on November 11th. Bye, everybody, and thank you so much for your time today. We'll see you in a couple weeks.